Uh, good morning, happy Sabbath. Just to have your attention for a moment or two. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so just two quick announcements from myself. Uh, the first of which is I would like to um, ask the church well, firstly, welcome to everyone. Uh, welcome, Auntie Gwen. As well, good to see you. You know, Miss today as well. Um, we are expecting, by God's grace, a decision on our church building plans by the middle of March, by the thirteenth, uh, to be precise. to hope that uh, a resolution is, has been found. So by God's grace, we will get there. So keep that in prayer, uh, in your prayers, so that we can have a positive decision. So that's the first thing. The second one is um, churches, like us here, are public spaces. And so we may have people come from time to time, sometimes people we don't know. And as part of the Adventist church, keeping the church family safe, you see at train stations and everywhere else, people ask you to be vigilant. Uh, the same applies in churches. Uh, so we ask that as members, uh, as friends, we are vigilant, particularly around our children and our public spaces, because, you know, sadly, the world that we live in today is not always the kindest, uh, and there'll be people sometimes with ill will. So, you know, just think, if we see people that we don't know around the churchyard, uh, you know, get one of the elders or the, the deacons, and, you know, we can approach it sometimes by asking people simple questions like, how are you? You know, you're visiting with us today, your name, you know, just simple things like that can help sometimes in weed out if people's motives aren't, aren't positive if they're here. So we ask them because, of course, we have children around the place. We have building, we're a public space. People can walk off sometimes the street. And because we assume that, oh, maybe it's a visitor, they just walk into spaces that we're not expect. So 
we just ask in that as as a church family we look out for each other look out for our children and if we see people or things we don't recognize that we raise that uh to the elders to the deacons and deaconesses okay is that okay yeah and together we can change so sometimes remember church is a very trusting place sometimes um but the bible tells us we ought to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves okay so let's just all be vigilant as we go around Thank you. May the Lord bless you. Those are the two from me. I hand over to Elder Glenroy. So greetings, greetings, and um, welcome back. And uh, I would just like to um, say happy Sabbath. And I, I trust that you have a wonderful week. And also, I would like to add to that, that if your week was as hectic as mine, then I'm sure you would be saying that there's no better place to be rather than in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. So greetings. Thank you for coming to Unwell today. And I would just like to um, add one announcement as well because the women's ministry leader would like all the ladies to keep this um, date in mind. That on the 25th of um, February, which is next week, yeah? The 25th of February, which is next week, there will be an emphasis, a prayer emphasis day. And our guest speaker will be Sister Linda. I say, I say, I say, I say, I hope I get that right. And also our song, songs of meditation will be done by um, Alexander, Yolanda. All of us know Yolanda Alexander. So I trust that you guys are going to be here next week because it should be an excited one. Yeah. So on the 20, 25th, which is next week. Okay. Also, I would just like to, we just have a word of prayer as we invite our praise and worship teams to lead us in some lovely song service so please just bow your heads close your eyes as we pray to begin our service dear father in heaven it is a pleasure privilege and an honor for us to be in your presence today lord as we come from near and far we ask that you baptize us anew wash us with your with isop and make us clean as we worship you today speak through our heart um, draw us closer to you. May everything that is said and done be done through your name, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Also, I would, there is a song I always like to sing just to welcome our friends and families and visitors. It says, they come from the east and west. They come from the north and south. We should have the, this, uh, the words on the screen, and we will. Yeah, Miss William, um, Hilda, do shall disappear. So, in a few minutes, I should say one minute, hopefully, it will be on the screen. So, some of you don't know the song, but I'm sure you will get it. Or if not, if not, we will just invite our praise and worship team. We will do it for the next one. Yeah? All right. So, we, we will just leave that for now. And our praise and worship team will just lead us into our song service. Okay. Okay. Happy Sabbath, Church. Welcome to today's Sabbath. And um, we'll just go into a session of praise and worship. Before we do, we'll sing our intro in the presence of the Lord. In the presence of the Lord. Thank you. 
Okay, we'll sing him 508. Anywhere with Jesus. Um, it's a nice, lively hymn, so let us sing as if we are anywhere with Jesus and feel safe with him. Number 508. I can Thank you all. So our next hymn is number 208. There'll be no dark valley when Jesus comes. I hope you all know this one. There'll be no dark valleys when Jesus comes. There'll be no dark Jesus, to the Lord's home. To the Lord's home. To Jesus, there'll be no Jesus, to the Lord's home. There'll be songs of greetings when Jesus comes. There'll be songs of greetings when Jesus comes. And the joy of greetings when Jesus comes. 
Amen. Thank you. There'll be no dark valleys when Jesus comes. Hallelujah. Our next hymn will be 604. We not not we know not the hour. We know of the monster dark. Yes, 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 He Till the master's God, that even though we do not know the hour, he will come. Amen. So we will stand now and sing our opening hymn, which is 528, A Shelter in the Time of Storm, number 528. The Lord in your 
Yeah, we'd like to thank our praise and worship team for leading us in this lovely song service. At this point, we will have our scripture reading, and um, we will have one of our young ones do our scripture reading, which is Benjamin, he's the nearby. So Benjamin will do our scripture reading for us. Mm -hmm. it's Acts chapter 27, reading from verse 27. No? Okay, mommy, you want to come or daddy? Please, mommy or daddy. <laughs> Happy Sabbath, church. Um, I will read Acts 27, verse 25 to 30. Now, when the 40 night had come, as we were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors sunset that they were drawing near some land and they took something and found it to be 20 fathoms and they were and when they had gone a little farther they took something again and found it to be 15 fathoms then fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks they dropped four anchor from the stern and pray for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, when they had left down the skiff into the sea under the pretense of putting out anchors from the top. Okay, thank you so much, Brother Andy, for doing our scripture reading. Um, at this point, we will now have our tithe and offering. Then we will ask our deacon or deaconesses or young ones, whoever collecting. And I think we will have a 
song played while we collect our title and so on. He hided my life. Okay, let's bow our heads as we pray for offering. Dear Father, we thank you for life. We thank you for your blessings towards us, your provision day by day. Today in your midst, Lord, we have brought our tithes and offering to you. So we ask that you will bless it and make it multiply. And we also pray for those who have um, who didn't have to uh, offering to pay today because of circumstances. We ask that you will bless them in a mighty way and may you continue to provide. And as we look forward to your second coming, may everything that is done and said, we will hear from you, lips when you come. Well and well done, though good and faithful servant. Thank you for your blessings towards us day by day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And at this point, we will have our children's story. And our children's story will be told by Faith. So children, if you need to come forward, please come forward as we have our children's story. <laughs> Children. Happy Sabbath, children. Happy Sabbath, church. I would like to pray for us before we start. Okay, I'll pray. Um, dear Heavenly Father, I come before you this Sabbath. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us here. We thank you, Lord, even as we're going to do the Sabbath, the children's story, Lord. May we be able to learn what you're, being, what you're going to speak about and be with us throughout the whole Sabbath. Jesus, I may pray. Amen. So how was your week, children? Perfect. Oh, what was it? Why was it perfect? Uh, because I had no homework. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who else? How was your week? Good. The same with Malakai. No herbal. It was half time, right? So you got to rest, then back to school on Monday. Okay, uh, today. And then, so then, come from the movie, and then, pass the moon, 
I'm like, hey, you see, and I just go, hey, we will, uh, the monster would say, oh, you're yeah, boy, move it, Tully, Tully, get out of here, Tully, Tully, what are you saying, Tully? Tully, 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 Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, today our story is about everything happens for a reason. And do you remember um, Sister Nancy's story about the king who had, who wanted to have a, a, who chose, who was looking for somebody to choose? Do you remember it? Yeah. If you don't remember, you need to go to Sister Nancy and let her tell you. She actually explained it very well with a pot of plant where somebody, some people did some things to their plants, but only one man who was the, who was true to what he what he what the with the plant, he came with it and, pro, and, and presented it to the king. So based on that, um today our story is also about uh, we, we are going to use imaginations, right? Because there is no there's not going to be any presentation on the on the board. So let's try and imagine a palace. Are you imagining a palace? Good. Then now imagine there's a king there in the palace. Yes, a king. And the king has a super um, has a supervisor where he, um, he when he an advisor when he wants some yes an advisor when he wants something he asks the advisor what what to do. So basically, this king um, used to go to the uh, battlefields, and when he got to battlefields, he lost. Then when he comes to the advisor and says, advisor, I lost this battle. Why did I lose it? Then the supervisor, the, the, his advisor used to tell him that, don't worry, king, everything happens with a reason. So then, there's, then there was a famine that came that hit the, the place very, really bad. Then he came to ask the advisor what to do. That's what the advisor told him. Everything happens with a reason. So again, um, there was this beast that used to come to the uh, village and taking people's cattle and uh, cattle, the, the animals, and going with this. So they had to go to the forest and, and find the beast so that the beast may not be able to, um, to take their cattle again. So when they went, the, the king also had to go because he was the he, the people looked uh, looked up, up to him because he was their leader. So when he, they went there, the battling with the beast, the beast accidentally cut off the hand, the the tiny finger of the king. Yeah. So when he went went when they went back to the palace and the king was crying and saying, "Oh, look at my finger! Now I don't have five fingers. What has happened to me?" Then when he went to ask his advisor, his advisor told him, it happens with a reason. Then the king was so mad. He was saying, you have my time when I ask you of this. You tell me everything happens to the reason. Then he, he called his guards to take the king, the, his advisor to the, to the he, he was captured and arrested. So this time when they, uh, because, because they were not able to capture the beast, they were had to go back again. So when they went back to the forest, uh, the, this um, looking, these weird looking people captured the king. And so when they captured the king, the, other, the soldiers ran back to report that their king has, had been captured. So the king with these weird people, looking people was going to be offered like a sacrifice to their, to their gods. So when they were about to offer him as a sacrifice, then the person said, no, 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 wait. This person is not full. Look at his hand. He's, he's not complete and the gods will be angry with us. Release him immediately. So he was released and was sent back to, to, to his palace. Then when he reached there, he said, oh, actually everything happens with the reason. Then he said, immediately release the, the advisor and tell him to come back here. So when the advisor came, then he's, he, he hugged, the, the king hugged him and the, he held a feast saying that actually with God, everything happens with a reason. So with that story, short story, kids, what do you learn from the story? Patience. Yes, the you, patience. What else? It's okay, yeah. So, 
everything happens for a reason. Yeah, so in life, everything happens with a reason. I would like to pray for us. <laughs> okay, I'll pray. Okay, dear God, we thank you for this what children's story that you've had and learning that with you, Lord, everything happens with a reason, even even in this. Even if we might not be able to understand why we're going through things, Lord, but I pray that we may be able to learn and be patient as well, to list to be able to have some patience and trust in you that everything that happens in our life, there is a season for it and there's a reason for it, King of Glory. I pray so that you may bless us throughout the whole Sabbath. In Jesus' name I pray and believe. Amen. Do you like my story? Do, do you like my story? Yes, you do. So don't forget to come again, to come again. Oh, yes, to tell us more. Thank you, Jesus. Like this song as well. We like to thank Faith for doing our children's story for us. And as she told us that everything happened for a reason, just remember that if something you consider to be something bad, don't blame God. Just remember it happened for a reason. At this point, we will now have our prison. I mean, our prayer song, and I would just like to call on the team to lead us into our prayer song, and um, Brother Tunga will pray for us. Thank you. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace this morning. We want to thank you, Lord, for your wonderful Sabbath and for the blessing of the Sabbath. Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit to lead us in each and everything that we are going to do in your house. May you open our ears and open our hearts that we may receive of your word. And may you put your words in the speaker's mouth, Lord, that you may speak that which comes from you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your love and for your wonderful mercies. I pray and leave everything in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So at this point, you know, we will, I'm sure most of you are here to hear the word from the Lord and they have uh, our dear elders, um, Duca who the Lord has chosen to speak to us today. We just continue to pray that the Lord will speak to him and we will hear a word from the Lord. So at this point, I will 
They step aside and hear that we speak to us. Thank you, Allah. Good afternoon again to you. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. I was at work yesterday and it's been a tiring week. You know, it's uh I had a big milestone at work. We had a tower crane coming down, was rushing to get some part of the building ready and I'm in construction. So it was a it was a busy week and I think the crane is actually coming down today. My so somebody said, Are you gonna be here tomorrow? I said, No, that's not possible. Uh, and he said, why? I said, I'm, I'll be at church now. I don't work on Saturdays. I never have, and I don't think I ever will. Um, but I said, you know, no, for me, it's a, it's a chance, an opportunity to regroup. When you, we're in an industry, and some of us work in, you know, beating nurses or so, you have long hours sometimes. You know, the Monday to Friday is long hours, and you're tired, you're tired and to, to, to think that you'd have to get up Saturday morning and do the same thing again. Lord, it is grateful. And Sunday, some people work seven days a week nonstop. And it is it is tiring. The, the mind hasn't got an opportunity to regroup. You know, you take the, the trouble from one week to the next. So for me, Sabbath allows me to park the troubles of last week, just regroup, and anticipate what new trouble may come in the following week. Amen? So I find it a blessing just to fellowship. So it's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to fellowship. Uh, most people get, what, 26 days a year annual leave. Uh, standard, I think, in this country. Well, you know, for us, we have an extra 52 days a year, right? So you didn't look at it like that, is it? So 52 days a year, look at that. Which employer is going to give you 52 days a year annual leave? Well, God gave you. So you see how generous God is? Amen. We serve a mighty and awesome God. So now you're looking at Sabbath a whole lot differently now, yeah? Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. As I mentioned earlier, just keep praying for this uh, church building. We want to get to a place where we want to see these old walls of torn down. The other day, uh, um, uh, Percy's son said to me, you know, uh, there's cracks in the walls. He's a future engineer. He says there are cracks in the walls. And he took me by the hand and he took me to the back and he showed me. He said, see the cracks in the walls. So I want to see not cracks repair, I want to see go down and something else come up, something else more functional uh, and more comfortable. I certainly a little bit more space for the kids around at the back as well. And uh, when we have our mothers and babies, they don't have to go around the back and stuff. You know, there's a space for them. So we need that. So please pray, pray about it. We just want to thank God for that. Also, before I preach, I want to pray because we've, we've seen the, the tragedy in, in Turkey and Syria. And, you know, I, 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 the last count I saw was about 30,000 people. I haven't seen the news in a, in a few days or so, so it, I can imagine it's a lot more. Um, but even despite the tragedy, I think there are still some hope, stories of hope coming through. I think six days after the quake, a boy was pulled out, out of the rubble. So we still see light of hope in that scenario. So let's just pray. Let's just pray about that situation. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to pray right now for the people of Turkey and Syria uh, following that uh, horrific earthquake there, Father Lord. We are told that as we are in the last days, these things will be. We'll see them more frequently, Lord. Yet still, when they happen, Lord, the, the tragedy, the, the human uh, loss, Father, is, is great. And so, Father, we feel it because it is not your desire that any should perish, but all should come to Christ and have eternal life. So, Father, Lord, whilst we cannot always understand why and how and the places that these things occur, Father, we know that you're still in control. And though sometimes it seems, uh, you know, not sometimes, it's a, it's a tragedy for us to see, to hear about so many people dying. Lord, we still know that you are still in control. And so, Father, we pray that you will give uh, comfort to those who need comfort right now. You'll give hope to those who are seeking for hope right now. And you will give strength and courage and endurance to those rescue workers, people working around the clock, day and night, to try and rescue or find people. So, Father, I pray for these countries. I pray for the situation there and that they will see the hand of the Lord working. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, my message today, um, abide in the ship. Abide in the ship. Or except he abides in the ship. 
uh, the text says, but abide in the ship. You know, sometimes when, um, when men opposes the work of God, it can really, they are, they are sometimes really, they stand ready to accuse those who are involved in it, right? There are those who, you know, they, they don't believe the work of God. They don't want to be involved in the work of God. And for those who are involved in it, they will find whatever reason they can uh, to try and hamper that work. You remember when uh, Nehemiah was trying to build the, the walls of, of, of uh, Jerusalem? Did he have opposition? Yes, you remember, you know, Daniel was there advising the king. And did he have opposition? You know, there are people. So sometimes when we're involved in God's work, there will be those who oppose it. And because they oppose God's work, they will oppose you who is involved in God's work. And this is where Paul found himself. You know, Paul was here preaching, and it actually covers about three chapters in the book of Acts. So pretty much from about Acts chapter 23, all the way through around to chapter 27, you find the story of, of Paul being, being bound or being arrested in chains and being passed from judge to judge, put it that way. So he'd been passed from judge to judge, from Felix to um, to, to to Festus, and then to uh, to uh, uh, Agrippa, and then obviously he appealed that he wanted to go before Caesar, and this is what was happening to Paul. And it happens because Paul was there preaching about Jesus Christ. Paul was there preaching about Jesus Christ, not in the traditions of the Jews, because as you know, Paul was a Pharisee. He says, "I was of the strictest sect." of the Pharisees. I was the one who went about tormenting the Christian. And when they were being accused or being killed, I would bear witness against them. So Paul was somebody who was heavily involved to be anti the work of Christ. But you know the story of Paul's conversion. That sometimes even those who are most opposed to the work of God, God can take those folks to do his bidding. And so sometimes we can't get to assured in our thinking that God hasn't got a purpose for that for that person over there, that person over there, even when it seems like they're in serious opposition to God's work. Sometimes those are the people God raises up because he sees their passion. You know, the people who sometimes oppose his God's work, they're very passionate about it. You know, they have energy and drive. You know, people who want to make your life a misery sometimes, they have energy, you know. They don't rest. Day and night, they're plotting and thinking about new ways how to give you trouble. Trouble is energy consuming. I don't know how they're managing high times in times of high energy bills. Because to give trouble requires energy. But God sees that energy and he says, huh, I can use it. So Paul was that sort of individual. He had energy to go against God and his word, to go against what's being taught. You know, Paul came from the Pharisees who believe, you know, this, these Christians talking about Jesus. What is this? We don't want to know persecuted them until his own experience experience along the Damascus road, God, he met Jesus and he heard the voice of Jesus. And from shortly after that, his passion, the same passion, the same drive, the same enthusiasm was now used for the work of God. Amen. So it's okay when we come with our life stories and we come with our past and we come with the things that we used to do before we make Christ. Sometimes we are ashamed of it and we think we have to get rid of everything. God doesn't want you to get rid of everything. He will change and he will make the passion you had for your reggae music. He will now give you that same passion for the gospel. You know, the passion you have for dancing, he will have that same passion for telling others about the love of Jesus. Amen. So don't think you have to, to lose all the passion. Christ will rework it, but only he can rework it. You can't. So let Christ, let Christ do that. So Acts chapter 25, verse 22 to verse 23. Paul is behind, in front of Felix, who said, look, you know, this guy, I've looked at him and really the accusation that is leveled against him, I can't really see. I can't send a man to die for this. You know, it doesn't stand up. But these leaders wanted to appease the Jews. They want to keep them quiet. So, you know, um, Agrippa was in, in town and he said, well, well, let's read. Acts chapter 25, verse 22 to 23.
So after appearing be, uh, before uh, Festus, again, who said, listen, I can't see any reason to hold this guy. I could let him go, but Paul had asked to go before Caesar. Now, as a Roman citizen, you had the, the right to appear before you know, Caesar. You could appeal to judge the matter. So one couldn't just accuse you and you get your head goes. Um, there are some places where if two people come together and accuse you, that's it, you're gone. Um, but Rome, for all its work, didn't work like that. You needed to face your accusers. They have to stand up before and tell you what is the matter. And so they came and, you know, the reasons didn't stack up. Then Agrippa said unto Festus, I would also hear the man myself tomorrow, said he. Thou shalt hear him. And on the morrow when Agrippa was come and Bernice with great pomp and was entered into a place of hearing um, with the chief captains and principal men of the city at Festus' command, Paul was brought forth. So Festus, so Agrippa came to visit uh, Festus and he was curious. He was telling him about this case and he was curious to hear it. And he says, bring him, let me hear it. So sometimes it's, it's weird that people want, people are just curious. And our life can become other people's curiosity. Because here was Paul's life becoming Agrippa's curiosity. And he came and he heard the case. You know, he sat and he heard the case. And the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 26. Now we'll move over to Acts chapter 26, verse uh, 30, after having heard the case, Paul explains himself what he's been accused of, uh, what he did. He says, listen, all I'm preaching is the resurrection of the dead, that both the just and the unjust shall be resurrected. And they didn't like this. The Jews didn't like it. And so after hearing the case, Agrippa says, and when, so this is Paul. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up and the governor and Bernice and said, and, this, and they that sat with them. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves saying, this man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds or chains. So at the moment he was in prison. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, this man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. So Agrippa assessed the case. He heard it out. He was curious. So he heard the case and, you know, Paul obliged him and he explained himself. And he's gone, actually, I can see this man is innocent. He has done nothing wrong and I should set him free. But because he asked to see Augustus Caesar, I can't set him free. He has to go to Augustus. It sounds similar, isn't it? You remember Jesus stood before um, Pilate? He, he assessed that Jesus had done nothing wrong. But he wouldn't let him go. He sent him instead to Herod uh, to be seen. So sometimes in our Christian experience, sometimes in our, in our life of Christ, we will have to go through the full legal system. We will have to go through the fight. People can see that we're innocent. People can see that you've done nothing wrong, but you will have to be dragged from court to court, from lawyer to lawyer to defend yourself even though you have, in reality, nothing to defend against. Now, I can't imagine, I once, I once said, if I, if I ever was going to go to prison, it must be for something I haven't done. Right? Sounds crazy, isn't it? But if I should ever go to prison, it must be for something I, I haven't done. Because I don't want to go to prison for, you know, for doing something. I don't go to prison for murder or other crimes similar, similar to worse. So it's better you're accusing me of something that I haven't done. And at least I know in my conscience, I'm free. But that said, folks can make mistakes in life. And, and people can end up in prison for many reasons. Even a good mind can set out on his way and one mistake and he could end up in prison. So it, it, it is not a judgment on prisoners. It's just recognizing that sometimes we can find ourselves in precarious position because the enemy doesn't like it. Or because you want to oppose God's work, and if prison stops you from bringing souls out of Satan's kingdom, he will send you to prison. 
And if, if, if going before one judge, the High Court, the Court of Appeal, the European Court of Justice, the United Nations Council, whichever, if that means, if Satan has to use that to stop you from doing what God has called you to do, he will do it. Because all the time that Paul was locked up, he could have been preaching the gospel, isn't it? All the time that the devil have us fighting and, and uh, uh, defending ourselves or having to defend ourselves, he feels it is time that he, he has taken away from us breaking down his kingdom. But he doesn't know who God is. God has a way of working with our circumstances, regardless of where we find ourselves. I mean, Joseph was thrown into prison. I, I, I mean, from there, he became second in command in Egypt. Paul and Silas, who is not a, was thrown into prison, and from there, there were men, uh, a centurion soldier, who, and his family were saved. Because the Bible says that at midnight, they started to pray and sing, and the angels came down, an earthquake, and the chains were broken. So even when Satan puts us in precarious scenarios, God is still able to use us. So it can be sometimes frustrating. I didn't sense frustration in Paul's argument. When you read through, Long chapter. When you go home today, you're going to read through from chapter 23 round to chapter 27. I didn't sense frustration in Paul's attitude, but I would have been frustrated. I think I would be pretty mad to know I've done nothing wrong. I've seen one judge, two judges, a king, and I still have to go and see somebody else. And that begins a story of Paul now going on this journey to Rome. So he's, in, he's now set off on a journey to Rome, on a ship to Rome, to be presented before Augustus Caesar. And on this journey, a centurion soldier found a ship. And he's sailing to Rome, and they set out on this journey. And Paul looks at how the ship is going, and they've, they've, they've gone through a couple of ports across Asia, and he can sense the weather that something is, is not right. And Paul says to them in chapter 27, verse 9 and 10. So let's read verse one first, chapter, verse one of chapter 27. And when it was determined that we should sail unto Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto a man named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. So one of uh, Augustus Caesar's um, ranks, soldier ranks, to deliver all these prisoners to Rome. And you know the Romans had a thing that if you're a, if you're a Roman guard and a prisoner escaped, that's it for you. There's no explaining yourself of how clever the, the, the jailbreak was. You would die. Hence why when Paul and Silas got out of prison, the soldier was ready to kill himself. Paul said to him, do what? Do not hurt yourself. We're here. So this is how the Romans worked. You're a god. You, your job is to guard a prisoner. So if that escape, you fail. Right? And so this is a sorrow. So it's not easy to escape from a Roman prison or soldier because he knows if you escape, what happens to his life? So he's going to make sure that you end up where you need to be. So they set sail on this journey and they're going through these ports in, in Asia. And then the Bible says, as, as Paul is, 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 is going through, they can sense that the, the winds and the, the, the waves, the, 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 the weather is changing. And Paul says, and when much time was spent, so at sea, and when sailing was now dangerous because the, the fast was, was well, the, the, the Day of Atonement was, was already passed, uh, Paul them, uh, ad, admonished this and said unto them, sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be a disaster and with danger, not only for the, for the, for the, for the ladding and the ship, but also our lives. Sometimes God puts us in position where we have to warn others. Our purpose will be to warn others. And Paul was on the ship as a prisoner, but he sensed because, you know, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. 
Sometimes we're in a place, Jonah had that experience. He was in the ship and the waves was blowing and the wind started and, and the, the, the people on board were throwing their, their things over. They were, they were trying to get the ship lighter. The storm just wouldn't uh, recede. It just kept stronger and stronger. And they were wondering what happened. Somebody have upset it got somewhere and they couldn't determine what it is. But there was Jonah quietly sitting in the ship knowing what was happening. Because spiritual things are spiritual desire. Sometimes around us, the storm is raging and people will be there wondering what is going on. The Christian knows what is going on. That's why God has us there so that we can reassure people or we can warn people about what is happening. At the moment, the world is in confusion. There's a storm around us in this world. People are confused. They, they see that their governments are out of idea and they're wondering what is happening. The economies are failing, inflation is going up, cost of living is going, energy, all these things are happening and people are wondering, what is this storm about? This is where God has placed us as Christians to be able to say, I can tell you that this voyage will be perilous. But there is hope. This voyage is perilous, but there is hope. This world is, is failing, but there is hope. Because Jesus is the master builder, and except he builds the house, the workman labors in vain that builds it. He is the master security, unless he, 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 he watches the city, him that wakes, wakes, but in what? In vain. So we are placing this situation to be the warning signal to those. So sometimes in your life, young people, old people, middle-aged children, as Christian, God will put us in position where we will be the trumpet to others. We will have to warn them. I'm not saying, because as you see, verse 11 says, Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of what? Of the sheep, verse 11. More than those things which were what? Spoken by Paul. So even though, Sister Pastor, you do as much as you can to warn Brother Ducal, Brother Ducal, I don't want to listen to you. Because we want to listen to somebody else. Elijah used to tell Ahab, behave a certain way. He says, I don't like this guy because he doesn't give me any good news. So sometimes we're giving warning to people, they won't listen. Because you're not the expert. What do you know about economy? You never study economics. What do you know about law? You've never studied law. Even though you have been to the school of Jesus Christ, the, the Holy Spirit, who is he's the greatest of all, have put wisdom and insight and foresight into you, and you're telling your leaders, you're telling your, 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 your political leaders, unless the nation return to God, there won't be a blessing. And they're saying, we don't want to hear because we have listened to the economic advisors and we have listened to the IMF and we have listened to the OECD and we have listened to this think tank and this thing. There's a lot of thinking in these think tanks. But they don't want to take what God says at his word. We studied a few weeks ago, uh, Shobu with Noah. He was telling the people about what is to come upon the land. But the experts were saying, look, we are versed in meteorology. And from what we understand and all the science, we have never seen a drip come out the sky. And so shall it forever be. And the Bible says they were there mocking and doing their thing until the day the flood came. We are saying to people today that this world is not going to last. It's not going to be because of climate change or Russia and you can Britain or Britain you can Russia, but because Daniel saw the stone rolling down from Babylon. The same stone, he says, will, will establish a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. People today still look at us as we're mad because the experts and the owners of these things tell them this will be fine sailing. This would be fine sailing. So don't be upset when you're not listened to. Don't be upset when 
you know, don't don't think that when you give advice, people are always going to jump on it. Don't, you know, think that when you tell the world godly counsel, they're going to take it for free. Don't be upset. In fact, they'd be upset at you for telling them that. But that's okay, because God just puts us in the position to be the trumpet, to warn people of the dangers that are coming. And so they didn't listen. So they set sail and they started to, to go and to, to sail. And as they were sailing, the Bible describes it as, you know, a wind, Eurocladen, Euro the wind. It's, it's a type of wind that says that, you know, you're going steadily and it starts to blow. And all of a sudden, the calm sea start to, to, to bring waves so high, you know, perhaps could cover houses. So they set out and they're sailing, but, you know, this, this sort of, of wind is now suddenly blowing and, and the storms are, are, are beginning to rage. The, the waters begin to become choppy. And later down, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 27 that there were probably about 276 people on board the ship. Many of them prisoners, including Paul. So they were there and they had their cargo because it's sailing to Rome. So you can imagine there are lots of cargo going back to Rome. People have lots of merchants and these things on the ship. And so as the storm is raging and it's picking up, as you're now going through the stormy waters, people are now trying to see what they can do to save their life. When they ignore the, the, the warning of God's people, sometimes you, you have to go through the storm. But because God is so gracious and so merciful, he doesn't just leave them to go through the storm. He allows the righteous to go through the storm with them. You see that? God could have taken Paul some miraculous way off that ship. And let it and say, I told you so. But he did not. Paul remained a, a, a prisoner on board that ship. And he was now going through the storm as well. So you can imagine Paul's mind when this thing started. Probably me would have said to them, you see, I told you so. You all should have listened to me. Come on, you know, you know that. We want to let them know that we were right. You, that attitude prevails a lot in the church. People make mistakes and we say, I told you so. I told you you shouldn't have done that. I told you you shouldn't have dated her. I've told you you shouldn't have married him. But the Christian don't need that. The Christian don't need that. The Christian recognized that even though the Lord warned you and you warned them, if they didn't listen, he still has you there to be a blessing. He still have you there to be a preservation on their life. He still have you there so that when the enemy comes after them, you can still defend. Because God is about saving people. He never stops. My disobedience doesn't stop God from trying to save me. Your disobedience doesn't stop God from trying to save you. So rather than I told you so, Paul was riding out this thing with them. So verse 13 and 14 says. But long after there arose a great, uh, arose against it a, a tempestuous wind called the Eurocladon. And when the ship was caught and not bare up into the wind, we let her drive. And running on the certain island or in the shade of certain island uh, called Clauda. We had much work come by the boat. So they were working. The storm was blowing. Paul was on board and he was there quietly. These sailors, they were trying all they could. They started to, to throw overboard all their cargoes to make the ship lighter so he can ride out the storm. Sometimes as Christians, we have to learn to ride out storms in our lives. It's not always going to be plain sailing. God is going to bring us into some circumstance which is going to be like Hurricane Gilbert. I say Gilbert because that's the only hurricane I've been in. 1988, little boy. And I remember this ferocious beast-like sounding calling wind. You know, songs are made of Hurricane Gilbert. These strong winds and it's blowing and it's raging and you're inside the house. And as a kid, it sounds like excitement. Of course, as children, you don't know danger. I mean, everything just sounds exciting. 
Probably the parents were worried the roof is going to come off, the windows are going to go, you know, something's going to blow, a tree's going to fall into the house. That wasn't our worry. We were just lovely hearing this, this sound, it sounded amazing. And then I remember the, 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 the ferocious wind and then there's a moment of calm. I was like, wow, the storm has passed. And I remember going outside and we're picking up mangoes because things are blown off of the tree. We were so happy, we didn't have to climb, we didn't have to throw a stone. The mangoes were just there. So we were picking up fruits and things like that until the warning came later on from the parents, it's time to get back in the house. Because sometimes a storm comes and there's a calm when you're in the eye of the storm and you don't know that it is as a storm. You don't know that behind the eye of the storm is another part of the storm. And so they think it's peace and safety. They think it is calm seas. And so now they are relaxing and now comes sudden destruction. So sometimes, because us as Christians, the Lord has brought us through storms, we are there to let people know the calm is not the end of the storm. Because we have been through certain scenarios, when people are feeling down and out, we can say to them there is still hope because we have been through this ourselves. Paul has done a lot of sailing this time. So he understood it, what was going on. So don't be too worried about the storm. Don't get too excited about the calm. Because the other part of the storm is to come, the tail of the, the hurricane, which sometimes can do more damage than the head of the hurricane. Put it that way. Because you've let your guard down, huh? You know, you came out, you open your windows, you start to take things off, you think, well, it's a nice sunny day. And then the tail comes and the, wind, the windows are out. The roof is gone. Sadly, sometimes people die in those scenarios. So understand the storm that you're in. And then we are hope for the hopeless. We must not forget that in our storms, God allows us to go through it because we have to be the hope for the hopeless. When the world is going crazy and, you know, young women are saying they don't want to have children because the earth is going to die with climate change. And, and, and kids are, are, are living in, in traumatized because they're so worried. They have listened to the gospel of Greta Thunberg and they are so worried that the earth is just going to fail because of climate change. You have to be the hope that says, I serve a God who says, I, I will create a new heaven and a new earth. I serve a God who says, I will be the one who will redesign this place. I will be the one who will restore earth to his former glory. I will be the one who will set up a kingdom that shall never fail. I will be the one who brings about righteousness. I will be the one who brings about holiness in this world. We have to be the hope for the hopeless. So in verse 21, the Bible says, and after a long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, sirs, so sometimes we just have to keep quiet whilst people are trying to work out what's going on when they didn't listen to the voice of God's servants. Sometimes we just don't need to keep saying, just say once and keep quiet. And let people go through their own experience of the storm. But whilst they're going through it in those times, they will feel as if there is no hope. There's no comeback from the scenario they found, they found themselves in. And that is when we now need to stand up to be the hope in a hopeless time. So after a long period of keeping quiet, that's what he says, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, good people of England, hear me out. Richard Sunak, hear us out. Yes, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosened from Crete and to have lost. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. In the middle of a storm that's raging, where we have been throwing things overboard just to hope, in the hope of surviving, you're telling us, we are at the point where we're throwing down our anchors and we're trying to find a way to do this. You're telling us that, that, that everything is going to be okay? We are giving a message of hope at a time when everything seems hopeless. It sounds mad 
It sounds crazy that we're saying to the world, you have a savior in Jesus Christ when everything is, is heading for disaster. We've been told we're about to be 1.5 degrees away from disaster. We're told that, you know, we can't have any more children because there's no food left. We're told we can't, you know, build anything because there's no water left. It sounds like everything is failing. And in that point is when we're standing up to say, there is hope. There is hope in Jesus. There is hope in God. So be of good cheer. For there stood by me this night the angel of the Lord. Praise the Lord. The angel of God. Whose I am. Whose I am. The circumstances around us may seem perilous. The storms are raging. The people not listening. They're stiff naked and hard headed. But you know whose you are. You don't, you do not belong to the Tory party or to Labour. You do not belong to, you know, the conservatives, the liberal. You belong to Jesus Christ. You know who you, whose you are. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So when folks are going crazy and they're thinking there has no hope, remind them who is in control. It is not Richie. It is not Putin. It is not, I don't even know who is in Germany now, but it doesn't matter. Because God is in control and we are the children of the Most High God. That is why Paul was so calm in the storm. He was so calm. Saying, fear not, Paul, for thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God have given them all, given thee all them that sail with thee. So you see, it wasn't because they took, the, the, the other 275 people on board the ship were righteous. It wasn't because they were necessarily good characters. I don't know. Maybe some of them were. Maybe some were just accused like Paul was being accused. But it doesn't really matter. But because of Paul's faithfulness and Paul's relationship with God, God promised him that all of those folks will be saved. So sometimes we find ourselves in, 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 a, in a disastrous company. We're working for a, a, a Lord knows a troublesome time kind of boss. But it's not about him. The Lord have us there because he says, there is 300 people in this company that I need to save that I need to do something with, and you will be my, 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 my mouthpiece here. You will be my, my peace here. You will be my hope in this hopeless situa situation. And so we have to trust God and know who we are and not worry about the circumstances or who are surrounding us. Allow God to lead. And so these men were panicking. I'm running out of time. These men were panicking that they will die, that they will not make it through. The, 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 the darkest hour is, the old song says what? The darkest hour is what? Just before, just before dawn. But when the 14th night was come, so they've been on the sea now for two weeks, and the, 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 the tempest just doesn't seem to be coming. And when the 14th night was come, and we were driven up and down in, in Adria, uh, about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. And so they started to, 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 to put plans in place, throw their anchor. We've been fighting this storm so long. Here we are at to some shoreline. So if we can get off the ship, then maybe we can save ourselves. And fearing lest that they should have fallen upon rocks, they cast, verse 29, they cast their, for their anchors out of the stern and wish, wished for the day. The darkest hours are usually just before dawn. In our Christian experience, our most difficult fight will be just before dawn. 
you know, weeping, the Bible says, may endure for the night, but joy will come in the morning. In, in, in the morning, we can see. We can see during the day. That's why we are children of the day and not of the night. We are children of light and not of darkness because the, the enemy wants to do his destruction. He comes but to steal and to kill and to destroy, and he wants to do it in the dark. But Jesus comes with the light of day to bring hope into the life of people. So when the storms are raging, it, it becomes most ferocious just before dawn. Don't, don't be tempted to leave the place of safety because somewhere out there looks safer. I'm saying the church sometimes may look chaotic. The church sometimes may look as if it's going to run aground. It's going to fall. It's going to fail. But I want to show you today, brothers and sisters, it is still the safest place to be. Because as the shipmen were about to flee, the Bible tells us, when they had let down their boats, their little lifeboats that they thought would save them into the sea, they've let it down under color, right? Under the pretense that though they would have cast anchors out of the, out of the, uh, the foreship. So they were pretending that they were letting down anchors, but really what they were doing, they were taking these little lifeboats, putting it down so that they could jump overboard and save themselves. Sometimes folks think they can save themselves. We cannot. And so Paul said unto the centurion, unto the soldier, sir, good sir, good sir, good sir. I can see, I can discern what your men are trying to do right now. They are trying to leave the ship because it looks as if it's failing. They're trying to jump off board and save themselves because it looks as if it's going down. But sir, I want to tell you something today, that except these men abide in the ship, he cannot be saved. Folks, I want to tell you something today, that the church that we are in, the, 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 the walk that we're doing with Christ, sometimes it feels precarious. Sometimes it feels as if we're going to fall down and not return. Sometimes it feels as if it will not reach its destination. But I want to assure you today that the safest place to be is on board the ship of Zion. Doesn't matter the impression. When the tides of life are so high that you can't, you can't climb them, he will roll you over them. The old songwriter says, I've never had a prayer that God couldn't answer. I've never shed a tear that he couldn't dry. And so when the waves of life are so high, you just can't mount them. The, the songwriter says, he will roll you over the tide. When everything else looks safer, when everything else looks more sophisticated, young people, when, when the world seems more clever, when they seem more sensible, when they seem more logical, and they're telling you all this great knowledge, when they can use more fancy words than your preachers can, and they want to convince you that God is not real, stay on board the ship of Zion. Brothers and sisters, when our relationship is going through turmoil and, and we're struggling and we want to give up, when we feel like we want to give up hope and God, I want to let you know, stay on board the ship of Zion. When the children have left home and we think they're not coming back and we're angry with God saying, why have you allowed my children to go out there and not come back? Stay on board the ship of Zion. When the finances have failed, and you work hard and you put it in the pension pot and you're hoping that you'll be having a nice and easy retirement, but you find yourself struggling. Stay on board the ship of Zion. Jesus is the captain. Jesus is the captain. And he says, Father, these that you have given to me, I have given back to you. And he has not lost one sheep. Because he has left the 99 in the fold and he came out looking for the one. So if he has to walk the storms, he will do it. If he has to walk on the water, he has done it. Stay on board the ship of Zion. So sometimes we're tempted. Church can be brutal because it's a ship. We're on board with characters that would rather not sit beside. That's the reality. 
we sometimes come in and we we found ourselves being given a seat next to folks that we would rather not talk to. Because when they say stuff, it's never anything encouraging. You lay your problems and you think, hey, we're in the same boat here, pray for me. But they mock you for praying they think you're drunk. This is the ship of Zion. With all its stormy characters, shady characters and choppy waters, it is still the ship of Zion. So I know I've been there. We're in our, in our own experience, in our own personal life, we're struggling and we're looking for a way out. Oh Lord, I'm just waiting for them to say one more thing to me. Just say one more thing to me and I'm gone. Oh, I'm just waiting for that sister to just look at my shoes one more time. Real, eh? I'm just waiting for a brother to walk past me and not say happy Sabbath, and then I'm gone. I'm going overboard. I'm saving myself because this ship looks like it's failing. This ship looks like it's sinking. This ship looks like it's about to be broken by the waves and the storms of life. But except he abides in the ship, he shall not be saved. The ship did break up. The ship did break up. If you read to the end, it tells you that some of the men, they swam. Sometimes to get to your destination, you have to swim a little. And not everyone can swim, so you'll have to catch a piece of board and float on it. It doesn't matter how you get there, is the point, as long as you get safely to your destination. It doesn't matter how long it takes you, as, 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 because you're standing on solid ground, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who got there before you. Some people can swim like Mike, uh, Michael Phelps. So they will, they, they like fish. You think they're humans who meant to live in water. But it doesn't matter because you are holding on to that piece of board that you found from off the ship that was now broken, but you're still paddling your foot and you're kicking. You'd never swam in your life, but somehow you're kicking your feet and you're floating and Lord make it so that you're in the sea because the water is less dense. And so you're floating better and you get to the destination and you are safe. If this was on a lake, you'd probably be in trouble because in a lake, many of us are led. We just keep sinking. But in the stormy seas, we have a chance. Sometimes the very waves that we are dreading is what washes us towards the shore. So even that which wants to destroy us, God used as the means to get us safely to the shore. So don't jump off board. 276 characters on board that ship were saved. <laughs> and the soldiers... The soldiers thought that maybe now that we have shipwreck, listen, we don't want to have escaped people. Let us, let us kill them. But God has a way of doing it. You know, there's a part in the story where the Bible says they hadn't ate for a period of time. And Paul says to them, look, let us break bread and eat. And they were breaking bread and they eat and they, they made merry. You know, they were, they were, they were, after they had broken bread and ate, they were joyful because they have been fasting for so long and their health was failing and so forth. Sometimes, you know, verse 35, and when they had thus spoken, he took bread and they gave thanks and they, in, to, to God in the presence of them all. And when they had broken it, they began to eat. Imagine what impression that Paul left on those those sailors and those, those, those fellow prisoners. In the middle of the storm, you can find time to break bread and to give praise and to give thanks. That confuses the enemy. How am I been going at these folks for so long and still they can find ways to eat together, to pray together, to fellowship together and sing praises to God together. It confuses Satan. So church, as we're going through our storms, the more, the, the, the more tempestuous the storms get, let us sing more praises. Let us fellowship more. Let us pray together more. Let us eat bread together more. Let us break bread together more, knowing that Jesus Christ is the captain of the ship of Zion and all of us on this ship, 
will be saved if we stay on board. All of us on the ship will be saved or the ship may go because the building is not going to heaven. The, the conference headquarters is not going to heaven. It's not. That new place in Norfolk is not going to heaven. None of it. But those on board the ship will be saved because they've trust in the power of the living God. I want to invite you today to, to say, Lord, I fell sometimes like I want to jump off board. I fell sometimes I want to take the lifeboat, which is quite a contradiction, and jump into the sea. But I realize that the ship that you are captain of is a place to be. You may have considered leaving. You may have left. You may be struggling on your way back. But you want to say to their Lord, help me to stay on board. I'm struggling. I'm thinking in my mind, if that's your desire, I invite you to stand whilst we pray. To say, Lord, I want to stay on board the ship. The storms are raging around me. I want to stay on board. I don't know how to swim, but you will get me safely to the shore. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are just too amazing. You are just too amazing. Father, you have done everything in your power for us to be saved. And so, Lord, I pray that we will take you at your word, that if we abide in the ship, none of us shall be lost. Father, let us then break bread, let us give thanks, let us fellowship in the full assurance that we are safe on board the ship, that you're captain of. The lighthouse, you are that lighthouse. I mean, you are the lighthouse, you are the captain. So we have nothing to fear. Lord, there are those of us who have really struggled and have been struggling. And those of us who are struggling with our spiritual journey right now. We feel as if, Lord, we want to leave. Some of us have just been at the door, just waiting for that one thing so that we can leave. Lord, I pray today that you will just bring us back. Bring us back to our seat in the house in the full assurance that we are with Jesus, the captain. Lord, some of us are lamenting for friends and family who have left. Lord, our earnest prayer today is that you bring them back to the ship of Zion. Oh, we have the full assurance that soon you will come, holy God, soon you will come. And you shall come and you shall say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Soon you will come, dear Lord, and you will say, these are those who have come tr through great tribulation. These are those who have wrote, who rode out the storms of life. And they remain on board the ship. Come enter into my joy. Come on the shores from which troubles will come no more. From which pain and suffering and sorrow will be no more. Come to the shore where, where death will never visit. Come to the shores where this appointment is not welcome. Father, Lord, I pray today, from the youngest to the oldest, that we will take you at your word in the sweet assurance that we are safe and secure in the arms of Jesus. This is our prayer in his precious name. Amen. We want to thank the Lord for the messenger, and we also thank the Lord for the message, and I pray that it will, it will, will reflect on what was shared with us today, and as we go through the week and look forward to the second coming, may everything we do here today. We are looking forward to hear from the Lord. Well done, though good and faithful servant. So please remain faithful. Now we just like to bring our service to a close. And uh, we will use it in five.
pray for our prayers and worship team will lead us in that way with your prayers and thank you. Set off the shore while the billows fall. Pass into the rock which cannot move. Grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. Thank you. We have an anchor. Jesus, you are that anchor. Father, it shall never be moved. Safe, fast and safe and sure, Father, Lord, until we get onto heaven shore, Lord, we know that we will be kept safe. So, Father, Lord, let us abide with you. Let us stay on board the ship. Let us trust you as a captain. Let us know that you are the master sailor. You know 
the weather, you know the, the seas, you know the seasons. And so, Father, you can bring us safely through the storms. So help us to stay on board. Help us to hold on. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus, 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 something else. Thank you. 